Okay, everybody, we are uh, here to start AP European History. This is my first video for this uh, particular curriculum, so we're going to hop right into it and talk about the Renaissance, and I'm going to have a bunch of small videos on the Renaissance um, because this is kind of the key starting point for what we refer to as modern European history. So we're going to get a little idea what's going on. I'm going to talk about some scholars that will help us set the scene, and let's just get right into it. Okay, so what is the deal with the Renaissance? Everybody loves the Renaissance, and the Renaissance is the end-all and be-all, and most people know, like, hey, it's a Renaissance, but they, they don't really know what's behind it. Now, we've talked already about kind of the middle part of Europe, or the Middle Ages, or what some people call the Dark Ages, even though they really weren't that dark, but the whole idea here is this, this is a French word that means rebirth, okay? And the idea I have here are changes. What we're going to see here in the Renaissance is a time period in which we're going to see a change in learning and scholarship. We're going to see a change in art and architecture. We are going to see a change in government. We are going to see a change in economics and trade. All of these things are going to come together to create a time period in which Europe is going to go from from really kind of bleh, like if I if, if you asked me where the most powerful nations in the world were in like the year 1400 or so, I'm not really picking a lot of things in Asia actually, or I'm sorry, not a lot of things in Europe. Rather, I'm going to be focusing on certain areas of Africa and Asia before I would get over to Europe. And the impact resultingly is huge. I mean, we know Europe has had a, a dominant role in society, that they are very involved today, and it's the Renaissance that are, that's going to give them that opportunity. And Italy is the place that this is all going to start. So what is the deal? Well, a lot of about the Renaissance that I'm going to be talking about was that all of that great knowledge from Rome and Greece that had been lost is going to get kind of pulled back in and then expanded upon, and all sorts of craziness is going to go on. And Italy is going to be in a really good position. Uh, first and foremost, I have access to Mediterranean and trade. The Mediterranean Sea was one of the hotbeds of trade in the entire world, um, dominated primarily by the Muslims at this time, or in the early part, and a little bit left of the Byzantines. But what Italy was able to do was to come into contact with societies that were a little bit more advanced, um, and they were also able to make some money, which is going to be really important, I'm going to explain, but it's going to be the access to, to the Mediterranean trade that is going to expose the Italians to things that weren't going on in the rest of the Europe, which is going to make a change. Um, and I have here Roman world and Greece, so I don't have a world, but Roman and Greece wasn't quite dead, so what do I mean by that? There were still copies of works. There were still some people that had kind of a working knowledge of some things. You still had like Roman ruins that could be looked at from architectural standpoints. So a lot of Italy didn't quite fall off the edge, if you will, as much of the rest of Europe did. And finally, I have economics of more freedom. Because the Italians were making a lot of money and because they were very involved in trade, the Pope, which had quite a lot of power going into this particular time period, um, kind of gave them a little bit more freedom. They were making money, they were trying new things, they were doing new um, things with like banking and government, and because they had money, and, and that's the thing, if you, if you don't have any money as a nation, there's not a whole lot you can do. When you do have a lot of money, and Italy wasn't one nation, it was a bunch of nations, this is just the area of Italy, but these city-states, as I'll be talking about, are going to have a lot of opportunity to make and effect change and have the freedom to experiment some things with uh, that other places really would not. Okay, and one of the big things that kind of dominates this era, and this is really important to understand, is this idea of humanism, okay? or the study of the humanities. So I think my little cartoon there really does show a lot about what the whole idea of what humanities is really about. And I, I love that little cartoon there. Humanists look at the world a little bit differently. They look at the world and they want to understand things at a deeper level. They want to understand why. They want to understand how. They don't really accept how things are, 
how they perceive things at face value. Okay, that's the idea about humanism. We want to get deeper. Now, a lot of what got the humanists going early was a focus on the study of Greek and Latin. And a lot of these works were coming back into play. A lot of them were rediscovered. There'll be some publishing things. I'm going to talk a lot about that in a moment. And they would take those great works and they're going to expand upon them. Okay. And again, the idea of the humanities, what are we talking about here subject-wise? You know, you've got economics, you've got grammar, rhetoric, poetry, philosophy, ethics, and oh my goodness, history. That's right, history is going to, you know, kind of have its heyday, and one day I'm going to try to bring it back. Now, literature is going to be crucial here. Um, I'm going to give a quick little shout-out to Johann Gutenberg, and you're going to be learning a little bit more about him later, but... What is going to be vital of vital importance was is this idea of literature, of publication. People are going to have new ideas, whether it's works of fiction, like plays and stuff like that, or, or some of our first novels in Europe, um, and poetry, to scientific journals and all that. All of this is going to be made possible primarily because of the invention of the printing press by one Johann Gutenberg, and we'll talk about him later, but that's going to be crucial. And what's also going to be interesting is that these people are going to be professionals. This is going to be an actual job that you can go and do. And what we know is that you tend to get um, more success if someone is a professional, and some of them are teachers and professors, secretaries to high-ranking noblemen, other political leaders. So you have a professional class of folk that are going to push this stuff around. Um, and this idea that is a secular world. We're going to be pulling away from religion, and the humanists are going to use this knowledge to impact change. And that's going to be crucial. The reason why I bring up humanism so quickly before the art and the architecture and all the other stuff that the Renaissance is most known for is that it is this new outlook. It is this educational change, if you will, that impacts everything. Okay, And most importantly, will impact the economics, what I'll get into, and it's just crucial, okay? And so now I'm going to introduce a couple guys that are going to kind of be on the earlier end of this and their work in the beginning of the Renaissance. So I'm going to say the late 13, the, the late 1300s, early 1400s are really going to help people along. And one guy here is uh, Lorenzo Valla, who um, was the secretary to the Pope from 1407 to 1450, or he lived from 1407 to 1457, and he was a grammarian. Yes, that's a job. So for you folks that are obsessed about grammar and punctuation, there is a job for you. Um, so what he really, uh, his main work was called The Elegance of the Latin Language, um, and what this focus is on is the actual Latin, the, the, the writings that were coming out of the Rome, of Rome in kind of its final centuries here. And what happens is, is this Latin, and I know it sounds kind of crazy, but this Latin becomes the main Latin that will be used by scientists and academics throughout the Renaissance. Now, some people will also publish in their native languages or their vernacular languages, and we'll get to that at a separate time. But this is crucial because science and learning gets better when scientists and professors and educators exchange information. If people are writing in a lot of different languages, today we have translation, you know, you can just translate stuff on Google and stuff like that. They didn't really have that opportunity, okay? If you, if you didn't live in Italy, you probably didn't know Italian. It took a lot of time to learn these new languages. But Latin, since it had been around so much with the church and still was kind of floating around everywhere, was still very present. And Lorenzo Valla had this important influence here that he kind of standardizes the language that people will use to write. And that's going to be huge, okay? And something else that he did was really important. One of the great things about the Renaissance is this idea of questioning. Okay, the guys in the Renaissance are going to be like, well, I know the Greeks said this and the Romans said this, but they don't have to be right. And that's really important. Yes, there are things that we know today to be true and, and factual because of tons and tons of um, experiments and stuff, but a lot of times people just take stuff at face value that can be very wrong. You know, 
a uh, flat earth or, y you know, a, a variety of things. I'm just throwing, a, you know, that one thing out there. But the idea is that, that when we look at things, we have to have a little bit of questioning in it before we just accept it. And he does something really important. Um, I have here the donation of Constantine. Um, the donation of Constantine was a supposed document written by Constantine the, who left control of the Western Roman Empire to the Pope. And the Pope had used the donation of Constantine as a way to consolidate political power for centuries, okay, um, especially because of the titanic importance of Constantine. Well, using language and examination, uh, Lorenzo Valla proves that it's a forgery. Okay, and this is huge. Like, this picture on the right is actually uh, a painting that kind of depicts, uh, actually, I think it's a, a fresco here, that depicts um, the Pope over here getting the, you know, the crown, if you will, from Constantine, who's over here. Some other dudes hanging out and guy on a on a horse, I don't know. Um, but this this is huge, okay? And so we're going to see this idea of, of what Valla says we have to, analyze language, we have to understand language, and everything isn't at face value. But probably the huge guy that early on set the tone for everybody was Francisco Petrarca, who goes next level, uh, not only intellect-wise, but he's one name. You know, once you get that one name, you're set, you know, whether it's Petrarch or or Newton, or, you know, Beyonce. It's it's really the same thing, Lynn, whatever. But what we need to understand, so he, here's a guy, he's an interesting background. Um, his dad really wanted him to be a lawyer, and he actually made, it, um, made him go to school for it for a while, until finally Petrarch kind of stood up to his dad and was like, um, this is ridiculous, and uh, I'm done with it, and so... But the one thing he learned from law school is he did like to read any like literature, and that's what's going to kind of set him on his path. Um, now, one thing I, I must say about him is he was definitely a little confident in himself. Here's a great quote. Some of the greatest kings of our time have loved me and cultivated friendship. When I was their guest, it was more as if they were mine. Um, so suffice to say, sometimes Petrarch would rub people the wrong way early on because he was just a touch full of himself, but his influence is huge and he's got some, some great quotes, you know, we got to love that, you know, man has no inner greater enemy than himself. Think about it. How many times have you like, you know, self destructed, if you will, or like, you know, you make a mistake, it's really on you. Um, so one of the big things that he does is he really seeks out a lot of works so that he can copy them and translate them into kind of a standardized Latin. Now, Valla would come later, but Petrarch was the one that really started this. Um, as he says here, Christ is my God, Cicero is the prince of language. He loved writing, he loved books, so he really made it um, very important to, again, help get that knowledge out there. Uh, he was also a big poet, lyric poetry was his big thing, and he, you know, wrote a lot of different poems, really um, getting people to be exposed to language. Uh, he wrote a lot of sonnets. He's tremendously influential on guys like Shakespeare later on, okay, writing about things like uh, unrequited love, um, and again, writing, uh, his specific, his muse, if you will, was a woman by the name of Laura. Um, and, and you see on the left, on, on the right here, you know, all about like life and stuff like that. True. We love life, not because we are used to living, but because we are used to loving. There is always some madness in love, but there is also always some reason in madness. Um, so it's, I think that's a, it's an interesting quote. Um, but he, he really was about, you know, getting people emotionally involved and, and getting people to read and getting people exposed to this language so that they understood, you know, knowledge. And, and he was huge. Um, he also was very big in vernacular. He wrote in Italian and a lot of 
uh, what eventually become modern day Italian does come from Petrarch and that's important because Petrarch actually had some success in this um, because prior to the 1300s you know one no commoners really ever had access to books but no one ever thinks that regular people would want books or would read stuff and and Petrarch would change that okay and so so now we're kind of off you know this is the idea of the Renaissance we're getting these changes we're gonna look at Greek and Latin stuff but we're not gonna take it all for for granted we're gonna write a little bit in in vernacular languages we want to be emotional and we want to have some kind of fun with life and and we're gonna see all this kind of stuff put together into some really interesting developments alright so um, make sure that you do the assignment that's associated with this and I will see you guys soon